whistle, my man starts. Yeah, thank you, whoever did that. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna follow up the Tuesday's nutrition lecture with internal nutrition today. Um, hopefully this won't be so redundant because I don't think you guys had a lecture on this before. Um, but enteral nutrition is nutrition that's delivered through a functioning GI tract um, bypassing the oral cavity, whether it's a tube that goes through your nose or um, like a G-tube that comes out of your, your stomach. So it's for a person that their GI tract works, it can, it can absorb things, um, it can digest things, but they just, for whatever reason, they can't have food through their mouth or they can't get enough food through their mouth. So indications for this would be somebody who has anorexia. Um, I've never actually seen it, but if someone has severe anorexia and needs to gain weight, and it's that psychological thing where they, they literally like cannot get themselves to put food in their mouth. And so if they go into the hospital, they'll put a NG tube in short term and give them nutrition to slowly have them uh, gain a little bit of weight. Um, oral facial fractures, so like given that it doesn't involve the nose or oral area where you're putting the tube, um, but they, maybe they can't chew or swallow because of the fracture. Um, head and neck cancers, a lot of times the tumors will push on your throat or your esophagus and so you can't get food down but your digestive system still works. Um, neurologic or psychiatric conditions. Um, uh, a lot of people in the hospital that I see with uh, PEG tubes or G-tubes are people with cerebral palsy. Um, so just a neurologic, you know, you're born with it, kind of developmentally uh, disabled um, condition where it's unsafe for them to, or they don't, you know, they don't have the developmental level to know how to put food in their mouth safely. Um, extensive burns and critical illness, when you're just so ill that you're on hooked up to so many tubes and you're sedated and you're so out of it that you're not able to eat. So contraindications to enteral feeding. So basically how I said, like it's for someone with a functioning GI tract. So basically anything that makes your GI tract non-functioning or doesn't function at its fullest. So a GI obstruction, um, ileus, which are kind of almost the same thing. Ileus is when um, the nerves uh, aren't working, so it's not pushing peristalsis through. So it's basically a blockage. Um, severe diarrhea, vomiting, or um, enterocutaneous fistula, which is rare, but it's when um, your bowels, like if you have some kind of inflammatory disorder, the bowels are creating fistulas, ulcers, like that are connecting to other organs or, or your skin or, or something. It's basically like a hole in your bowels. Um, so I don't know if you guys can see this very well, but it's an algorithm, or maybe you have it on your paper, but it's an algorithm kind of to determine who is going to need enteral nutrition. So if someone that needs nutritional support um, and has no contraindications, um, so no obstruction, ileus, um, peritonitis, anything that contraindicates um, having the tube. Um, so we go to enteral nutrition. Um, long term would be the, the gastrostomy or jujunostomy. So that's an ostomy, that's like a stoma coming out of your, a hole in your, um, in your abdomen. And then short term, um, needs would be nasogastric, nasoduodenal, nasojejunal. But those can also all be oral, orogastric, oroduodenal. Um, it's much more common to see a, a nasal tube, though. I've actually never seen one with an oral feeding tube. Um, but nasal tube going into the stomach is nasogastric, duodenal, dejunal. It just depends on how far down in your GI tract the tube goes. Um, and then it kind of goes into if your GI function is normal or compromised, what kind of formula then we, that we put through. And then the other side of the uh, algorithm, which we're not going to go over today, is parental, parenteral nutrition. So somebody without a functioning GI tract that needs nutrition has to go through their veins. So these are types of tubes. Um, so nasogastric, like I just talked about, so nasogastric through the nose to the stomach. Um, I, I've never seen this. This is like, I, this is really rare, I'm sure. Esophagost, I don't even know how to say it. Esophagostomy. Um, I've never seen one of those. I think it's probably pretty rare. Um, gastrostomy, so just the hole inserted in your stomach. 
um, jejunostomy, so into your <coughs> jejunum, and then the naso nasoduodenal or jejunal, depending on how far down the tube goes. So the orally or nasally inserted ones, when you see someone with the tube coming out of their nose, um, those are for short term. I mean, someone can't long term have that, that there. It's just, it's not good for your tissues. It can create skin breakdown. There's a whole bunch of reasons you don't want that there long term. But short term, if it's expected for less than four weeks, then it could be an oral, oral or nasal tube. And um, by the way, when I talk about like nasogastric tubes, have you guys seen people in the hospital with the suction? the t nasogastric tubes and they're attached to suction. Mm -hmm. So those are like really big, those are like I'm 14 to 16 French or something. So like that's different, that's the suctioning, the tubes for suction are a lot bigger than the feeding tubes. The feeding tubes are like um, eight to 12 French. They're like little, like thinner than a pencil. And, um, and those are for things going in versus suctioning out. And then if you're expected to need it for more than four weeks, so that's like someone with cerebral palsy where you know they're not gonna like come out of that, they're going to need enteral nutrition for the rest of their life, basically. Um, it's gonna be either uh, a G-tube or a J-tube, which that's the, the traditional surgical approach where they actually just put you under general anesthesia, um, make a cut in your abdomen and insert it. And then the newer, um, like because of technology, the newer kind is percutaneously inserted. Um, and that's where they put a endoscope down your, oh, I have a picture. <laughs> instead of trying to describe this. So they put an endoscope down your esophagus and that creates like the camera and some tools down there. And then, um, they, so they kind of come in from both sides and it's, um, it's less invasive. It, only, it doesn't require general anesthesia. It's just like um, local anesthesia and IV sedation. Um, so this is kind of like the newer, less, uh, less dangerous and like easier recovery type of insertion. Okay, and then we kind of saw in those pictures, but um, the tubes can terminate um, in your stomach, which is nasogastric, um, or in your duodenum or jejunum. So, um, and the reason for, for going farther down in the stomach is a risk for aspiration. So you don't want to be putting um, a bunch of formula into someone's, straight into someone's stomach if they have a high risk for aspiration, or, or regurgitation, if they already have um, like GERD or some kind of thing that's going to make them kind of regurgitate things, they have that much higher risk of, um, of aspirating the, the formula. So someone with a risk for aspiration, is going, they're going to prefer that it goes all the way down um, past the um, pylorus, <laughs> is that what it's called? Um, thank you, yes. So it's past the stomach, so that's not gonna regurgitate up into, into your lungs. Did you have a question? Yeah, on this PEG procedure, is uh -huh. there um, a risk of infection? There still is a risk of infection. Of yeah, there still is a risk for infection. It's lower than with traditional surgery, but there still is. <coughs> um, and then uh, the most common tube that I, the na most, most common tube I see in the hospitals for feeding is a nasoduodenal tube called a Dubhoff. That's the brand name. So a lot of times, like that's just what we'd call it. We'd be like, oh, did you flush your Dubhoff tube? And like, if you ever hear that term thrown around, that's a nasoduodenal tube. And then contraindications for a nasogastric is facial trauma, like to the nasal area, obviously. You don't want to put a tube down a, a traumatic area. Um, nose, frequent nosebleeds um, or someone on anticoagulation therapy. So that if they're really prone to bleeding, you don't want to stick a, try to stick a tube down their nose, all the way down their tissues. It's just going to create a risk for bleeding. Okay, so once we have the tube in, there's different kinds of feedings. Um, there's a continuous infusion that uses a pump, um, and then a cyclical infusion. These are basically the same thing. Um, what's your question? Oh, on the picture prior with the uh -huh. anticoagulation therapy. Yeah. Continue, are those people on tube feeding also immobile and therefore on kind of Well, they might be on aspirin as like a general pro prophylactic. Um, so just switch the drug with them. Say that again. So you could just switch the drugs if they require two feeding. Maybe, or like if they, I mean, if they were on Coumadin and they needed nutritional support, um, I don't know if they would think about giving them a peg tube or if I, I don't know. I mean, if it was going to be long term, they'd just put a peg tube in, you know. And I'm not sure, but um, 
I mean, I think most people who are, we don't really like put people on Coumadin just for immobility. Usually people, we don't put people on Coumadin until they have a clot. So um, general prophylaxis for um, clots is like aspirin. So, and that'd be okay if they're just on aspirin, that's fine. Coumadin is kind of like the big, like, okay, they're gonna bleed if we do anything. Um, so continuous and cyclical are like kind of the same thing. Um, continuous would be like 24 hours a day. Um, we don't really do that. It's not very practical in a hospital. There's too many interruptions. So um, most people these days are doing cyclical, um, which just means it's most of the day, but there's some downtime. So like in our hospital, I think it's like <coughs> 3 p.m. to 9 a.m. or something. But there's a, there's a protocol for like, your order set when you have a patient on feeding, your order will say like start feeding at this time, um, at this rate until this time. Um, and that allows for downtime. So that, and it's usually in the morning, so you can do your bathing, your ADLs, your physical therapy, like anything that um, you know you don't want someone hooked up to a tube uh, to be doing. And then there's intermittent infusion by gravity, where like someone would just kind of like have like a the little device that they pour the fluid in, and it just it would just flow into the tube by gravity. And that's more common um, at, in the home setting. If somebody like with cerebral palsy at home. They have a caregiver or their parents or whoever are feeding them can do the just kind of pour the fluid the liquid in and let it kind of drain in for the feeding how long does that take? what's that how long does it take um i think they say you want it to be like 20 to 30 minutes and there's like a clamp on it so like if it's wishing in too fast you can kind of go in in little little bits and then intermittent bolus by syringe so same thing so it's intermittent intermittent and um, you're using one of those, have you guys seen those big, um, like 60 ml mm -hmm. syringes? And um, so you, you know, put the formula in there and, and inject it. And that's also more common in the home setting. Um, in the hospital setting, it's mostly, everything is on a pump and it's most likely going to be the cyclical kind where they have the downtime. Okay, so with cyclical or continuous, cause they're kind of the same thing. Um, so when we start someone on a tube feeding, um, we want to start slowly, like just like anything, we want to see if someone tolerates something. Um, we don't want to just start putting tons of, of a new formula in someone's system um, without letting them get used to it. Um, but we still um, use full strength formula. We don't like dilute it with water. Um, diluting with water increases the risk of bacterial contamination. Um, so when you have a patient that's starting a tube feeding, your doctor will order it and say like, start at 30 mLs an hour. For times four hours, um, you know, if tolerated, increase by 30 mLs an hour every four hours, or whatever. There'll be like a very precise like formula that your formula, <laughs> use that term loosely, um, like a or very precise order that will tell you exactly like how to start it, when to, how often to increase it, and by what. Um, let's see, and titrated. Oh, I said four. So titrate every eight to 12 hours toward the goal rate. Oh, so your order will also say the goal rate. It'll say like the goal rate is um, 80 mLs an hour or something. And so you're trying to titrate it toward this goal rate. And then you're monitoring the patient frequently because you wanna see if they're tolerating it. Um, if they're not, they would have um, high gastric residuals, which I'll talk about what those are. Um, nausea or vomiting, um, like cr if they're complaining of cramping or any kind of abdominal discomfort after you start, um, or diarrhea. So these formulas are very, very like hyperosmolar. And so you put it into someone's system and it just like, it has like such hyperosmolarity that it like pulls in all the water into your GI tract. And then if it's like pulling in too much water, you just have diarrhea. Yeah, you just, and then you just get dehydrated. So it's kind of a high risk for that. So that's why we start very slow. So your body can kind of adjust to it and you can stay hydrated. Okay, so this is um, an example of an intermittent feeding. Like I said, these would be most likely to be done at home. Um, and you know, I, I, in like the home health setting, I don't know what the orders look like, but it would, it would tell you something like to initiate it at a small amount per feeding and then increase it by this amount every feeding until you reach your, your goal, goal amount. Um, and so you typically have like 200 to 500 mLs per feeding and four to six per day. So like every, every four to six hours have a feeding. And then administer over 20 to 30 minutes. So this can either be like a syringe or like I was talking about, I don't even know what they're called, but it's just kind of, there's like these containers that kind of look like a syringe where they're wider and they, they just have an open top and you just pour it in and let it, let it flow in. 
and this would be like a gastrostomy or jejunostomy. And then, so there's four types of formulas. Um, there's only one that's most common in the hospital, but I'm going to go over all four of them. So um, polymeric is some kind of thing that the, like the, the caregiver um, blends up, like they're blending up whole foods basically into a smoothie um, that they then put down the tube. Um, so it's nutritionally complete, um, so it's, it's like eating real food, it's just that someone's pulverized it so that you can put it through your G-tube, um, but your GI tract must be like fully functioning to, to absorb all those nutrients. And then modular is um, just like a, like a supplement basically, a single macronutrient protein or fat or whatever the patient needs specifically. Um, so it's only meant to supplement. So that's for someone that maybe they are eating, but for whatever reason they have a higher requirement of protein or something and they can't get it through their mouth, I guess. So um, it's more like just a supplement to go through their tube and it's not complete food. <laughs> and then, so elemental, that's the most common in the hospital. Um, it's it, it's a, like a, a formula that someone's like uh, manufactured um, that is nutritionally complete um, and it's pre-digested to be easier on the GI tract, uh, which I mean most people in the hospital who are sick, they're probably not going to have the highest functioning systems anyway, so it's a little easier on that. Um, and then specialty formulas are like for some, like diabetics. So I've had put an example of that here. So glucerna, that would be like one that you will see in the hospital for a diabetic patient who's on a tube feeding. Um, they come in these little cans, it looks like a little like soda can, and you just pop them open and like pour it in the, the bag that the tube feeding is attached to. Um, so elemental is the type you'll see most often in the hospital. And then specialty, I've actually only seen um, glucerna. I haven't seen, I don't know what those special ones are for liver failure, pulmonary disease, or HIV but I guess just know that there are specialty formulas. I have a question. Yeah. Um, what's the like main difference between elemental and polymeric? I mean, just that it's milk-based and that it's blended? So polymeric is something that like somebody makes at, in the home or something. Like some, like I, like say I put some like, like milk and like protein powder and like vitamins or whatever and I like mix it all together and I blend it up and then I give it to my baby or something. And elemental is like this manufactured formula where someone's like chemically decided who, how much carbohydrates and fats and like, and they put it in this can and then it's like ready to use. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. But they're both, I see what your point though is that they're both nutritionally complete. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but yeah, one's manufactured and one's more like a, more like a smoothie. Got it. What about the modular? You said that it was not complete. So where, how do they get the other, uh, the protein or whatever else in what? Route, do they get the rest of the so they would most likely be able to eat a little bit, okay, so but they're probably not able to get everything they need, and I so it's more—it's like a supplementary type of thing. So I'm not going to go into like all the specific steps of inserting an NG tube. You guys are going to do that in your skills lab, and they'll teach you exactly like how to do it and how to position the patient and stuff. But just like a little like heads up about it. Um, so I talked about this already. The size is the 8 to 12 French, uh, much smaller than the one you see that use, is used for um, suction or decompression. Um, it has like a, a guide wire um, inserted into it so that once you, you, it stiffens it so that once you're, in, when you're inserting it, it's easier to, to insert, but then once you know it's in the right position, you remove the, the guide wire. So what is the French equivalent to 8 to 12 French? It's just a it's just a size of tubes. You know how we use gauges for IVs, uh -huh. and it's that and that's backwards. So like gauges are backwards, right? Like a yes. twenty gauge is smaller is than a wait. Let me say that again. Twenty gauge is bigger than a twenty four gauge. Correct. Like so, gauge is like the smaller, the smaller the number, the bigger the diameter. So French is is normal. The bigger the number, the bigger the diameter. So like eight to twelve French is like this size that I have a picture of. And like 14 to 16 French is those, those thicker ones that you see with the suction. Okay. <clears throat> and then when you're, um, when you're measuring to put in a gastric tube, um, this is how they tell you to measure it. So like you'll take a tube like this and like put the end of it at their xiphoid process and they tell them to turn their head and you pull it up to their ear and hold it there and then go to the tip of their nose. 
and then you hold it there and you see there's this these tubes are marked in centimeters and wherever you're holding it when you measure that that's how far you want to like stick it in like you don't want to go farther than where you're that is so you kind of mark that with tape or something and then you insert it and you don't go past that point that you put the tape on and um, inserting that's for nasogastric only to the xiphoid process um, nasoduodenal they actually say to the um, to the navel except inserting nasoduodenal is kind of like a special thing that like your book doesn't even go over so you don't really need to know that but just know like for nasogastric that's how we measure it, is the nose, the earlobe, to the xiphoid process. Do you, uh, do you have to like take people to x-ray to see how far that tooth went? Or? Yes, exactly. That's, I, that might be on my next thing, but yes. So um, one of the major points that um, we're talking about today is that the, way, the, only, the best way to identify or to confirm that you have the tube in the right place is by x-ray. That's really like the one and only like total confirmation. There's other ways to, um, yes, so you can do pH is like the second best and, and it's easier than hauling the x-ray machine into the patient's room every four hours. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the best way is definitely by, by x-ray. So, so here we go. So, um, so when you're inserting it, you know, you're going to look for that piece of tape that you um, put on the tube so you don't go past the piece of tape. And then once you think you have it in the correct area, then you do aspirate a little bit of the, um, the juices and test the pH. Um, so this is just so we, we, we know what we're like, we think we're in the right area, we want to test it before we go to x-ray. Um, and then if we do get the right pH, like I'm trying to get in the stomach and okay, like I test the pH and it's 3.0. Okay, I think I'm in the stomach. Now let's take them to x-ray and confirm that it is in the stomach. And then you can't use it, you can't put anything through it until you get that x-ray. So even if the doctor says, like, I need him to get this medication through his NG tube stat, like, you can't use it until you get that x-ray and make sure it's in the right spot because, like, what we're scared of is it going into someone's lungs. Mm -hmm. A conscious person is going to choke and gag when you're putting it in. Someone who's, like, semi-conscious, they may not show any signs if you're putting it down their, their lungs. Yes? Um, for medications that you can't crush, mm -hmm. how do you give that to the patient? So you, you can't. <laughs> like, you have to, the doctor has to figure out um, another, if they can't take it orally and it can't be crushed to put down their tube, the doctor has to figure out another way to, to give them medication. So they're going to have to like order a non um, sustained release form of it. Yeah? How do you section up the pH when you have the tube to do? Just <coughs> or is there a oh, yeah, sorry. So I think <coughs> I have a slide on this, but um, so you're going to use one of those um, huge. Okay, my slide is like two away, but I, yeah, I'll go over that. Okay. <laughs> so once verified by x-ray, then you can um, mark the tube uh, with, with tape, which you kind of already did, but you're, you're marking it like for good with tape or like a Sharpie or something. Um, and you're charting it in the chart. You say like that I inserted this tube and it's at this many centimeters in. Um, and then a lot of old school nurses will use an auscultation method where they'll, um, uh, when they want to check if the tube's in the right place, not initially, just like when they go to use it to give a med or something. Um, they'll use a syringe and inject air through it. And while they're injecting the air, they put their stethoscope in their stomach and listen. And you're supposed to be listening for bubbles, like like, it, like if you're like gastric acid, like it's blowing bubbles from the air inserted. So some nurses still do that, but it's not best practice and it's not recommended. So don't do that. They were doing it to sniff. <laughs> oh, yeah. they. I mean, people do it all the time. That's how people did it for years and years and years. So it's not like they're like crazy <laughs> but it's just not it's not best practice like we're not teaching that anymore you told me specifically remember that you always have to go back <laughs> yeah it's, well and the thing is it's way faster than getting the ph strips or finding the ph strips or like you know it's just the whole ph thing it takes longer and nurses don't have a lot of time so if it's easier for them to do that they might do it but just know that's the wrong way <laughs> but even with the ph if they are on any anti-acid how will you monitor? So good point. So um, the pH is off in the stomach. They're taking it's going to get higher. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. So actually, um, if they are taking antacids, it might be like four to six. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. I didn't even put that in my <laughs> lecture because I always th thought it was like kind of confusing. But um, but yeah, you're right. So if if they were on, on antacids, you'd have to know ahead of time of that. And then when you if you get a pH at five, but they're on antacids, you're like, okay, that's still okay. So I think what the book says is like it's like four to six is like Correct. what it would be in the stomach mm -hmm. if they are on antacids. 
Um, but the thing is, when you do check pH, you're supposed to do it at least an hour after medications. So it's possible that the antacids could still be in there working, but you're supposed to always check pH after, at least an hour after you've given a medication so that it doesn't interfere with it. You want to ask Say the first part again. I guess they, I think they probably, hmm, I think they probably would affect intestinal, but I don't know for sure. I don't know if they're like processed before they pass the pylorus. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know. So wait, at least an hour after medication administration, the um, intestines, right? Just any medication. If you if you give any medication and then you need to check the pH. Um, you're supposed to wait an hour after any medication before you're checking the pH. Okay. So the pH confirmation is um, the second most reliable method. So the x-ray is our number one tool to make sure it's in the right place. And then this is the next acceptable way um, to confirm the tube placement. And this is because you're going to get the x-ray initially, but then you're going to need to frequently check um, while this person is on two feeds, you need to like frequently check to make sure it's in the right spot. You need to check it before you um, give an intermittent feeding. You have to check it um, every eight hours for cyclical or continuous feedings. Um, and then prior, I, don't, I didn't even put it on there, prior to a med giving a medication. So you're going to want to make sure it's in the right spot. Um, and then PRN. So like if you see, come to the patient's room and like you see that the, it's like two centimeters further out or something than, than it's supposed to be, um, it might be okay, like you might be able to just re-advance it, but you want to check the pH to see like what area you're in. Um, and so to do this, which I think was one of the questions I haven't answered yet, so um, you'd use one of those huge syringes um, and you'd inject 30 ml of air and that, clo that flushes out any like formula that's still in the tube. Like say, say they're still on the tube feeding, you go to give them the medication. The tube feeding's been going, there's you know, formula in the tubing, you shut the pump off, um, and then you just inject air to clear the tube of, of the uh, formula. And then you um, aspirate back just five to 10 ml, put in a little medicine cup, um, and then you take your little, like there's like a, be like a little, um, not vial, but a little like, I don't know what to call it, where they keep the pH strips. Um, but like the, the thing where they keep the pH strips, it has like the, the, the key on it. And you just take the strip and dip it in for however long it says and then compare it to the, the little key and it'll tell you what the pH is. Um, oh, and also you'd wanna assess the appearance of the, the aspirate. And so um, the gastric is gonna be, and I don't have a picture, I wish I had a picture of this, but um, kind of a clear greenish yellow for the gastric and an orangish brown for the intestinal. Oh, here's a picture of the, the test strips. Um, so yeah, so you dip the strip into the cup and compare it to the color chart. And then gastric would be 1.0 to 4.0 and intestinal 7 to 8. Or if they're on an antacid, it's probably possibly a little higher for gastric. Um, okay, so checking for gastric residual volumes. Um, so this is, let me just start by saying there's a reason it's called gastric residual volumes. We don't ever do this on the um, duodenal or jejunal tubes. Um, since they're past the pylorus, they're like in, in a, a small, like in an intest, small intestine. Um, if you try to pull back too much, like you can do the five to 10 ml to get the pH, um, but if you try to do too much, um, it's just gonna suck against the wall of the intestines and cause tissue trauma. So we don't check residual. Um, and besides that, like the, intestines aren't like a holding tank like the stomach is of fluid so it just doesn't just doesn't go with with what we're doing to check residuals if it goes past if it's a transpyloric tube so this is only for gastric tubes um, so we were checking prior to an intermittent feeding um, or every eight hours of continuous and so it's kind of like the checking the pH too um, same thing we're checking the the pH before um, um, intermittent feedings and every eight hours if it's continuous. Um, so what you do is you just put that huge syringe on and you just pull back and it's, you know, it's probably, it might be more than that will, that will fill that syringe. Pull back and empty it, pull back and empty it, see how much you have. Um, and it, if it's more than 150 mLs, um, 
then we're kind of worried that they're not emptying their stomach as quickly as they should be. And I put C facility policy because there's actually different answers on this. There's not one standard answer. My hospital says 200 is the like the thing that you, if it's more than 200 is when you like hold the feeding and notify the doctor. Um, your book actually also said 200, but the last lecture that I was like kind of basing my lecture off of said 150. Um, but, but I mean, your book also says like see facility policy because it can change. Um, but about 150 to 200 um, gastric residual is where you're gonna start to question it and be like, okay, I don't think they're emptying their stomach fast enough or we're feeding them too much food or whatever. Um, so the first thing you do though is you just return that to the patient. Just whatever was there, you push it back in. Um, hold the feeding. If it's on continuous, if they're on continuous feedings or if you're about to give them an intermittent feeding, um, you stop the feeding. Um, tell the doctor. Um, they're just gonna say, okay, hold it for an hour and recheck. That's kind of like a standard policy. And then um, you recheck and if it's still that high, then they're gonna hold the feeding and like try to figure out, maybe do some diagnostic tests to figure out what's wrong because there's some kind of delayed gastric emptying going on that they're not sure what's going on. Um, and if it's less than 150, so they have processed some of it um, when you recheck, then the doctor will probably give you an order to restart the feedings, but he's gonna change the rate and make it slower. So, cause after, so after an hour, it's less than 150, you realize, okay, they are processing some of it. They're just not processing it as fast as we thought they would. So we can still feed them, but just not as fast as we were. Yes? If it's still over 150 after an hour, do you return the residual again? Yes, good question. I think so. <laughs> Wait, good question. I don't know. Don't write down the answer. I don't know that. I would, maybe, maybe you don't. What was your question? If it's still over 150 after an hour, I don't know, and I don't think my, what I was reading off of told me the answer to that. Yeah, because it's full already, so what would you just not put it back in? I can, um, just because it's not like they are electrolyte, they are electrolyte. The reason why you put I can, it I can, I can email you guys about that. I don't know the answer to that. Well, right. Right. Did anyone read that? Well, no, but oh, well, well, aren't you just checking? Good. You're not, you're not, you're checking, right? So. Yeah, but if they're not, like if they have like gastroparesis or something, oh, okay. and they haven't processed any of it, I would think that you do. No one I don't, yeah, I don't think you would put it back in. That is, it doesn't make sense because you're just putting them at risk for like nausea, vomiting, and uh -huh. um, I can get back to you. I don't know, I don't know the answer to that. I w it would just be a guess if I told you, but I, I mean, I would guess no, that you no don't. Guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's never happened to me, so I, I've never had to cross that bridge. Um, yes. Uh, the five to 10 milliliters that you were talking about mm -hmm. don't draw more than that back to the pH confirmation is what you meant, because then that will um, like collapse. Col yeah, or like cause the, tissue trauma. Yeah, yeah, or, col yeah, or collapse like the, the bowels, yeah. Okay. So like it is okay to aspirate a tiny bit, because you're going to want to before you give any medicine um, or feedings or whatever through a duodenal or jejunal tube. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but just that little bit, you're not gonna try to like pull back everything that's in there as you would on the gastric residuals, you can actually pull back anything that's in there because the stomach's just a holding tank. You're right. not going to like necessarily collapse it. Okay, you know? thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maintaining the patency of your tube. Um, so for continuous feedings, um, you wanna flush the tube with 30 mLs of an hour, or 30 mLs of water, sorry, at least every four hours. But you guys aren't, you probably won't be actually responsible for this because most feeding tubes are on pumps that have a water side. So usually there's a, a feeding side and a water side. And usually the pump will automatically do the, the water flush for you. And it'll be like 25 mLs an hour or something. It'll be in the doctor's order. So like the doctor has the order all set up for how much formula per hour and then how much water per hour. And then as long as you set up the pump right, it's flushing it for you. So for continuous or cyclical feedings, you're not actually going in there and flushing it every four hours. Although technically you probably will be more often because you're probably gonna go in there with medications. So, so you'll probably be, end up flushing it anyway, but um, just for, to maintain patency, you're, you're probably not going to go in every four hours and do this because you're most likely you'll have a water tubing on your pump that'll do it for you. And then, um, so if, you're on, if someone's on intermittent feedings, so again, that's probably more likely somebody like in the home setting, um, it'd be before and after each tube feeding. So 30 mLs 
after it before, give the feeding, 30 ml of water after, and that just cleans everything out. Um, and then before and after drug administration. administration. Um, and definitely warm water is better because it can help dissolve any little particles that didn't crush very well. And then after checking gastric residual volume. So after we pull back that 5 to 10 mLs, check the pH, then we're going to flush it with water. So everything just kind of keeps it cleared out. Because anytime, anytime you, you try to aspirate, you're pulling the fluid back and it's just like, it's, you're putting at risk for clogging when you're pulling stuff into the tube. So you always want to flush it like after checking residuals or after checking the pH. Yes? Um, yeah, it may be. I mean, based on the patient's fluid needs, yeah, like the doctor might order a lot for a dehydrated patient or a little bit for someone that's like maybe drinking a little bit of water. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, the it's providing hydration. But do you, so I've never seen any of those tubes where people on tube feeding, can they have fluids in addition to the tube feeding? If, if they're it? able to, if they're able to safely like drink fluids, yes. It's just highly unlikely because the reason that they have a tube is probably because they can't. Yeah. So, I don't know. Like in the case of like a anorexic patient, they might be drinking water, but they won't just won't put food in their mouth. And so they might have a feeding tube, but they're still drinking water. They're able to swallow, right? They just don't. They don't. They won't put food in their mouth. Yeah. Okay, and then, um, so if the tube becomes clogged, say you go to give a medication and, um, and you try to, and you're trying to flush it with that 30 mLs of water to, before you give the medication, and you meet resistance. Um, so well, the first step is flush with 30 mLs of water. So you kind of like just use a little gentle pressure, see if you can, without like totally just trying to shove it in, like a little gentle pressure, see if you can kind of just uh, unclog the tube. Um, if that's ineffective, you can use carbonated beverage, which the, the book said, huh? what the book said it's not recommended. They use cranberry juice and carbonated juice. Oh, really? And they said. Okay, well, I my, I was using my old med surge book from when I was in nursing school, and they did teach us this. And I see nurses like put coke through, feed, which was so weird the first time I saw it. But so your book said not to use carbonated uh, at all, yeah. or you just don't, they just don't prefer it. You know, there is a special kit that they use for that for clogging. Oh, a maybe that's like a newer <laughs> thing that I don't. <laughs> maybe that's like a newer thing I don't know about. Like my med search book taught us this. Um, what people putting soda? Yeah, I thought it was still an acceptable practice, but I guess uh, what she's saying is probably that now they have actual like things that you can push through that that's going to unclog it, like an actual like like order for whatever, the, I don't even know what it's called because I've never heard of it, but. Yeah, but not every hospital might have it. Yeah, I don't know, ours didn't, so we actually <laughs> put coke down it. <laughs> yes? Um, my personal experience, my father's feeding tube would get clogged a lot with uh -huh. medications, and um, they, the nurses actually asked us to go to the vending machines and get coke. Because yeah. They it's used uh, something called Clot Buster. Oh, okay, well, that's what. White, like a thick white, uh-huh. I don't know. Yeah. It stinks really bad. <laughs> it looks like caulking. Yeah. And they would and there was a wire. And that's it's, what they would do. They're kinda like the plunging it. This, and it would never work. And then they'd get the coke and they put it in and let it sit. Yeah. And, and come that's, back ten minutes later and it would just push right through. That's what we do in my hospital still. So if <laughs> it's I don't I mean <laughs> So I guess that maybe the clot buster thing is like preferred. Probably. But um, I know my med surge book, which is only like four or five years old, like said this is an acceptable practice. Um, okay, so whenever possible, you want to use liquid medications instead of crushed tablets. So you can be a good pa patient advocate here. A lot of medications come in liquid form that um, the doctor might still have a, an oral med prescribed because when they switch from taking POs to, you know, now they're NG tube or something. Um, maybe the doctor kind of kept the same medications on their list and you realize like, oh, actually like we can, um, we can put that medication, we can put it, let's put that in liquid form and then we can put it through their pay. So, um, so definitely look out for things like that. Um, the crushed tablets obviously are going to clog the tube faster than a liquid medication, so that's the reason. Um, and don't mix medications with the feeding formula. Like if you crush the meds, like don't mix it with some of the formula and then like 
push it through the tube. Like we just crush it and we mix it with um, warm water. So like you'll have a little like medicine cup with your crushed pills and you'll kind of squirt a little warm water in there, mix it around with a syringe and then draw it back up. And then that's how you inject it. It just dissolves better that way. Yeah, it's just, yeah, basically. It's just, cause like crushing the pills like doesn't always work as well as you want. So you kind of like mix up with warm water, push it down a little bit, kind of like make it as, as small, smallish particles as you can. Um, and then ensure the tablets are safe to crush. So we kind of already talked about this, but extended release, you want to make sure you're not crushing an extended release tablet. And then um, just some like general nursing guidelines for G tubes or J tubes. Um, so that's, these are the ones where it's going to be like inserted through their abdomen. So you're going to want to assess um, the insertion site, site, especially if it's a newly placed one. That's when you have the higher risk for infection. After they have it for a few months, it kind of, their body kind of adapts to it. But right, right after it, you want to definitely be assessing it frequently for signs of um, infection. Um, and you want to rotate it. Um, 360 degrees every day and that makes sure you actually don't want that like embedded into their skin like you don't want it to grow into you want the tube to always be like movable um, so you want to be able to rotate the g-tube or the j-tube you don't want their like skin to like grow around it and embed it like in one place that be just I think it's a risk for infection and also like if it gets tugged or something it's going to cause trauma so you want to actually rotate it make sure it's, it's movable like in that hole um, and then you're going to cover the site like around it with a sterile split gauze um, and change that daily or PRN. Um, they might need more frequent changes like right after it gets inserted. There'll be a little more drainage um, when they're new. But a split gauze is, um, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's like a square, it's like a square piece of gauze like about this big and it has like a cut like just halfway through part of it so you can like put it around. I wish I had like an example. But so you can like put it around the the hole and it still kind of it still covers the abdomen and so it's not like you don't need to like it's not a sterile process to like touch around the g-tube or anything but we just want to put sterile gauze around the part that you know um, where it's, it's it's going into their their body um, if you do ever need to clean the site you could just if it's a healed um, you know it's not a, a super fresh one if it's super fresh I think you just want to use like um, sterile saline to clean around it if it's if it's been there a while you can use soap and water to clean around it if it's getting a little crusty. So this is so this is like what a bag of formula looks like. Um, so like, you know, you don't have a the picture of the patient here, but the patient would be laying down here and have their like G-tube or um, NG tube or whatever connected to tubing and they would come up to this bag. And, um, and so this bag, this purple thing screws off and it's just this large opening where you pop open the cans and like pour the, feet, the, the formula in. Um, and you only want to add four hours of feeding to the bag at a time. So even though, so these bags, you only change every 24 hours. But you, so you use it for 24 hours, but you don't put the whole day's worth of formula in it at once. You just add four hours of feeding at a time. So it starts to get low. It's like about this low, pour in some more. Um, and that's for bacterial uh, growth prevention. The, I mean, the stomach is not a sterile environment, you know, it's just a clean environment, but we still don't want to, we still want to minimize the risk of uh, bacteria that we introduce into it. And then I couldn't find a picture, but normally there's, there'd be a water bag hanging here. So there'd be another bag that looks very similar to this right here, and then you have the formula bag and the water bag, and then both going through the pump into the patient. Okay, so we're gonna go into the complications of enteral nutrition um, and kind of like the nursing interventions that you would do to prevent or resolve the complication. Yeah, can you tell the guys out out there? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, okay, so pulmonary aspiration is probably um, the number one complication of enteral feeding. Um, so the, high, the formula is dense in calories and sugar. Um, it provo like provides a good growth or a good uh, medium for bacteria to grow. And then so if there is some bacteria, you know, in your stomach and then you aspirate it, it's kind of puts you at high risk to get pneumonia or some other kind of infection. Um, 
So preventative measures are things we already talked about, like um, initially when you put it in, you're gonna get the x-ray and make sure it's in the right place before you use it. Uh, you know, check the, the pH before you give a drug or give it uh, intermittent feeding or um, every eight hours if it's continuous. Um, and then you wanna keep the head of the bed, if tolerate, keep the head of the bed at least 30 degrees. Um, so same with like aspiration precautions for someone like with dysphagia and you want you know how you want to keep them up if when they're eating so same thing you want to keep their head of the bed up um, during continuous and for at least 30 minutes after intermittent feeding um, and then if you do have to lower the head of the bed um, like we've had to do this at our clinical site sometimes to like change a diaper or something so if you just pause the feeding um, and do whatever care you need to do and then put them back up Um, diarrhea, so I kind of already talked about this. The hyperosmolality of the formula pulls in a lot of water into your system. So um, if, if we're feeding them a little too fast, or they're just not tolerating it as fast as we thought, it's gonna pull in all that water and cause diarrhea. Um, one of the things you can do intervention-wise is um, add probiotics, because maybe it's not quite for, I guess, yeah, it's a different cause of diarrhea, but if it's from um, some kind of GI bug, you could add probiotics. Um, they might need antibiotics if there is an actual GI infection. Um, but if it is just from uh, feeding too quickly, they're not tolerating it, you're gonna slow their rate down based on the doctor's order. Um, and there's different, there's different types of formulas. There's like hypertonic formula, isotonic, isotonic. So they might, the doctor might change how strong the formula is. Um, and then you wanna wash the formula bag every eight hours and then change it every 24 hours. So we talked about the changing the bag um, every 24 hours, but you want to wash it every eight hours. Just rinse it out with water. It doesn't have to be like like sterilized, but just rinse it out with water every eight hours. Um, so on the other side of that, um, if you're not if you don't get the diarrhea, you might get constipation. Um, and so some things for that would be to changing formula with more fiber. Um, they might need more water flushes. Maybe they're a little bit dehydrated. Um, or free water if they're if they're drinking fluids, you can give them more fluids to drink. Um, and if they're if it's somebody that's able to ambulate, you're going to want to get them up and get them moving more because that's probably one of the causes of their constipation. Um, so tube occlusion. This is actually I take it back when I said aspiration was one of like the main. This would be this is the thing that happens the most with feeding tubes is, is occlusion or clogs. Um, so we talked about how do you maintain the patency. You want to flush it with the 30 mLs of water before um, before intermittent feeding, before medic before and after medication, um, and then your water flush if it's on a pump will do that for you. Um, so possibly due to meds not being adequately crushed, so you want to make sure you get the fine grains when you're crushing the, the pills and mix it with the warm water, kind of dissolve it. Uh, make sure you're irrigating before and after medications. Um, we're not mixing medications with formula, like we talked about. Um, we want to push for the liquid forms of medications instead of pills. Um, and I already said the last one. Um, tube displacement. So um, if someone's vomiting or coughing, a lot of times that'll pull up the tube and it either kinks um, in their GI tract or it actually comes all the way up and can go in their lungs. Um, so if it's just if it's just a little bit, like you just notice it's one, a couple centimeters out, you're allowed to try to like readvance it and check the pH. Um, if it's significantly out, if it's um, there's no like numbers on this, but if you, if you feel if you have good suspicion that this tube is not in the right place, it's like significantly out, you want to yank it. Um, and especially if they have any symptoms of respiratory distress or um, or they're coughing, gagging, whatever. So um, delayed gastric emptying. So this is like we talked about residuals, and if they're having too much residual, maybe they don't, they're not emptying their um, stomach as fast as they should be, um, which could be from gastroparesis or just their peristalsis is slowing down because they're immobile. Um, the doctor might uh, order a prokinetic medicine that helps empty their stomach. Um, the most common one that I've seen is metoclopramide, which is Reglan. So they might um, administer that, and what that medication does is it's kind of an anti-nausea. I don't know if you guys have probably seen it for anti-nausea also, 
but the way it, it is for anti-nausea, but the way it works is it empties your stomach faster. So in the case of nausea, it's emptying that, that acid out of your stomach so the acid's not sitting there making you nauseous. But for this effect, it would be pushing the formula down faster um, so it's not sitting in your stomach. And then, and then the other thing was like maybe they needed a, a duodenal tube instead of a gastric tube if they're having all this gastric fluid like stay in their stomach. Maybe they need to pass that pylorus and just go all the way into the intestines. Um, so electrolyte imbalances, um, so it could be caused by, by diarrhea, you know, if they're having the diarrhea from us feeding them too fast, they're going to get electrolyte imbalances, um, if they're just dehydrated because we're not giving them enough fluids, um, or if they have some kind of chronic uh, liver or renal disease. So you'd be monitoring their electrolytes daily, that pretty much happens automatically in hospitals, you're always drawing the blood in the morning. Um, administer free water, which can just be like whether it's them drinking the water or you're just pushing extra water, that's not, you know, the pump's giving them a certain amount, but then the do doctor orders that you push this much free water right now for the two. Um, and then replete electrolytes as needed. Um, so just, you've probably seen people get IV potassium or, or, or in this case, you could do it through their um, NG tube if it wasn't that critical. Um, but you'd just be monitoring their electrolytes and then replacing them if needed. So refeeding syndrome. So this is something that can happen to somebody that's chronically, um, chronically malnourished or like chronically not getting enough food and then all of a sudden someone that hasn't had enough food in a long time all of a sudden gets a bunch of food um, so what happens in, in like a starvation state is your body like your body's insulin kind of stops stop um, it's not working because you're not having any sugar in there for the insulin to work on and so when you then start eating food all of a sudden you get this rush of insulin that hasn't really worked in a long time and it's pull, it's pulling the food into the cells but it's also pulling a bunch of electrolytes out of the out of your blood into the cells and so it just like really quickly depletes your blood of all these electrolytes and um, it results in hypophosphatemia hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia um, and it's very dangerous I mean it could be such a quick change that it's um, it could be bad for your heart or your lungs um, so that's definitely one of the reasons we also advance um, feedings really slowly but especially for someone who like is anorexic <coughs> and has been in a starvation state um, or someone was you know found in their home and brought to their hospital and they haven't eaten in weeks or whatever um, for whatever reason if you know they haven't really eaten in a long time you're gonna be really careful and, and advance the formula very very slowly to make sure you don't create this refeeding syndrome and then just like a note about um, enteral versus parenteral um, if someone's not able to eat their own food, our first choice is obviously enteral. Um, parenteral is really if their GI tract isn't working. Um, there's a lot of benefits to enteral. Um, it has less, less cases of infection or sepsis. Um, and minimizes the hypermetabolic response to trauma, which <laughs> I obviously copied and pasted because I can't think of how to describe that. Let's see, minimizes hypermetabolic. Oh, so if you have trauma and then your, your body needs to go into like a hypermetabolic state, then you're a, more able to cope with it. Um, it maintains your intestinal structure and function, so your intestines still know how to work. Um, it's safer, less expensive, and it's e easier to do. Okay, so I have short lectures, you guys. I have, I have three slides left. <laughs> and I don't know if these were on your thing. I might have added these last night. So I just want to talk about your nutrition paper. Um, so... You're gonna have a case study due this quarter. It's due on the 26th of May, I think. And um, it's going to be, it's, a, it's like two parts. It's a paper and then like six appendices that are kind of like all these different kinds of assessments and analyzations. Um, and it's all in your syllabus. Um, so, and I don't, I'm not gonna go through every single page. But basically you're gonna focus on one of your patients that you're seeing in clinicals and do all these assessments on them and get their nutritional data, do like a full nutritional assessment. Um, there's a couple other like that you go to like the myplate.gov website and find what their like you know best diet plan is and like kind of do these like these little projects and then after you do all those like analyzation things then you write it's a four to five page paper and it's kind of like a summary of like everything you found out assessing them and then also recommending what changes could be made um, based on best practice um, okay yeah so four to five pages of text um, intro you summarize their diet and identify their problems and then make recommendations and the the syllabus has the rubric like very clearly like um, 
explained, like exactly what we're looking for. And it also has for all the um, appendices, it has a template for all of them. So what I was telling my um, clinical group is like just to bring all those like templates into clinicals like the week that we're doing this project and just kind of like use those to like just jot down all your notes and then you can take it home and type it all up. Now the food intake would only be based on what they consider in the morning exercise. So there's a there's a bunch of different there's one that's like a 48 hour diet recall. Um, so do we tell the patient to keep track of what they're eating? Or? Well, no. It's just you're just going to ask your patient when you get there, like, what did you eat for the last 48 hours? Can you remember? And they may not be able to remember. Mm -hmm. um, well, I was also telling my students, like, whatever week you guys are picking your your patients, like, make try to have a patient that can. Uh, converse with you, yeah. Because if you have someone that's just totally out of it, you know, in, your might, project might be easier, but you're not going to get any information, so it's probably not going to be a very um, thorough paper. Um, so yeah, so there's a bunch of things. One of the things is just like a nutritional assessment. You know, like their physical assessment. You know, do they have dry skin? Do they have like thin hair? Um, and then one of them is the 48-hour diet recall. Um, one of them is like going onto the my plate. Gov website and like finding out their like plan for how many calories they're supposed to have. There's and there's specific instructions for all these things. So like, don't worry if you don't know what I'm talking about. Oh, so here's here's the appendices. So client health assessment. So that's the full um, like physical assessment, focusing on things that might point to malnutrition. Um, 48 hour diet recall, which is you just asking them if they can remember what they ate for the last six meals or whatever, the last two days. Um, nutrition history, you know, do they have any um, GI disorders or eating disorders, um, deficiencies? Um, oh, the client health assessment includes labs too, like their, if they have low potassium or whatever. Um, you're going to do a nursing care plan. Um, so I'm assuming other instructors are doing the same, but like my group's not going to have a care plan that week because why would you have two? Um, so the care plan, I think there's, I think it has two diagnoses on it. So you do two diagnoses with the outcomes and the interventions. Um, oh, daily pl food plan worksheet from choosemyplate.gov, and then a nutrition analysis, which is like there's a template for that. You don't, that's not something that you have to figure out. I have a question. Yeah. The nursing care plan for the case study should mm -hmm. it be specifically for nutrition or? Well, it's going to be like on this patient that you've already done all this like assessment for it, right? Right, but if they have, say, a pulmonary problem, oh no, so it's, sorry, so it's trying to focus on their nutritional state, yeah. Um, I mean, it's yeah, I, basically, <laughs> which will be hard because I mean it might be hard to come up with two diagnoses that are both nutrition related, but I mean I I guarantee hospital patients have them. So try to get someone who is below or about their BMI overweight or anorexic and that teaching. I mean, yes and no. I mean, I think I think that everyone has a lot of nutritional problems in the hospital. Like, yeah. what I told my patient or my students was just like, kind of want to stay away from the like 20 year olds that just got like an appendectomy. I mean, they <coughs> have a lot of like nutritional problems. Mm -hmm. Like, but everyone, like for the most part, everyone in the hospital has a lot of problems and probably multiple nutritional ones and that might be why they're there. Or they might have nutritional problems from their condition or whatever.